friends and fellow travelers. Tonight we will witness a conversation between two old friends. Erwin and Hans Ulrich first met when Hans Ulrich was 17 years old, and he asked his parents to take him to Erwin's studio as he wanted to meet him. And this makes to, me really old. <laughs> <laughs> and due to Huo's age, it was the only way he could get there. I will leave them both to recount this first meeting and the many meetings that followed, but suffice to say that Hans Ulrich's parents, who waited for Huo outside the front door, became very, very nervous when he didn't reappear and imagined only the worst had happened. I'm not quite sure what worse they imagined, but anyway, they were very, very concerned and much relieved when Huo did eventually um, go back to them. When I told Hans Ulrich that uh, Jadeus had invited me to curate this exhibition, he professed his enormous admiration for Erwin's work and talked about his wealth of ideas, his passion um, for creativity, and the extraordinary commitment he had to making work over many decades, which of course is evidenced in part by this exhibition. Erwin lives and works in Vienna and also in Limburg, Austria. He's a graduate of the uh, University of Applied Arts in Vienna and best known for his explorations of the material and conceptual boundaries of sculptural form. Over the last two decades, he has also explored clothing as a sculptural theme, as a second skin, a protective shell, an outline or the filling in of the volume. In work such as his large-scale installations, where fixed architectural components are dressed in knitted pullovers, to a wide variety of other forms, he is also focused on the notion of time in his complex multidisciplinary species. The dust sculptures, the performative one-minute sculptures, one of which is outside here on loan from Tate, and in recent years, his work has been the subject of solo gallery shows in Switzerland, Austria, USA, Korea, Hungary, and the Philippines. Owen has twice represented Austria at the Venice Biennale in 2011 and 2017 to great acclaim. This exhibition will be followed by a solo gallery show in Germany and Hong Kong and two group shows, Der Handiwerker and Klinglicht in Austria. Later this year, he will have several solo museum exhibitions in Marseille, France, at Musée d'Art Contemporain, and Musée de Beaux-Arts, Musée Cantini, and Vieille Charité. It's an extraordinary career, and we're very, very proud and delighted to have you here. Hans Ulrich is an old friend and fellow campaigner. As artistic director of the Serpentine Galleries in London, he has had a very distinguished and notable career. Prior to this, he was curator of the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris, in Paris, of course, and since his first show, World Soup, The Kitchen Show, in 1991, he has curated more than 300 exhibitions. In 2011, he received the CCS Bard Award for Curatorial Excellence, and in 2009, he was made Honorary Fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects. And in 2015, he, he received the International Folkwang Prize for his commitment to the arts. As I'm sure you're very familiar, Huo has lectured internationally at academic and art institutions worldwide and is contributing ed editor to a number of magazines and journals. He is the author of the Interview Project, an extensive and ongoing series of interviews, and his ongoing Art of Handwriting project on Instagram protests, the disappearance of handwriting in the digital age. He is also the co-founder of the Brutally Early Club, a discussion group open to all that meets at Starbucks in London, Berlin, New York, and Paris at 6.30 a.m. Over its recent publications include Monda Mondialité, Somewhere Totally Else, Conversations in Colombia, Ways of Curating, The Age of Earthquakes for Douglas Copeland and Schumann Bazaar, and Lives of the Artists, Lives of the Architects. He is a very dear friend and, like Erwin, a very unique human being. I feel very honoured to have had the opportunity to get to know Erwin's work in depth as a result of working on this show and experience firsthand how he uses what appears on the face of it to be uncomplicated strategies 
to remind us not only of our own bodies, but also about the people that surround us. The body enmeshed with a chair so that the two become a sculpture. The one-minute sculptures that put us in touch with our vulnerabilities and fragilities. The ceramics, a new body of work that focuses on parts of the head and body that become surreal images when viewed in isolation. The legs carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders as visitors enter the exhibition. Drawing is at the heart of Erwin's practice, as you can see upstairs by the installation, the twilight lamp, and the armchair, which are also, of course, another way of talking about the body. There is an enormous amount to talk about, gentlemen, and I'm looking forward to it greatly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Julian. Thank you so much to Tadeusz, Julian, Polly, and everybody here at Tadeusz Hopacz Gallery uh, who organized this talk. And of course, foremost, many, many thanks to Erwin Grohmann. Please give another very warm welcome to Erwin Grohmann. <laughs> it's also particularly exciting to do this talk in this room surrounded by what I think we could call a return to photography because Erwin told me in our last conversation we did for the catalog of the Venice Biennale that for more than 10 years uh, you had not returned to photography. So this is a really new chapter through Polaroid. So we're going to talk about this. Um, and there's so many chapters, of course, we can discuss today. But I thought it would be great to begin with the beginning. And I wanted to ask you how you came to art or how <laughs> art came to you, if that was an epiphany. That's, that's a good question. It was actually, I, I, I lived in, I grew up in Graz. Graz is a small town in Austria. <clears throat> and uh, it, it was, um, my, my father was a policeman mm -hmm. and, we, and we grew up in a kind of social housing where many families lived in a, in a house and there was a comet going, flying over the house. And in, in, this, in, this, in, in this house with several apartments, three young guys became artists. So very surprisingly, it was a result of the comet flying over the city. <laughs> and then we met, because Julia mentioned that first meeting, that I was a teenager and I started to be obsessed by art. After when I was like 14, I discovered the long thing because of Giacometti. But actually through sculpture, I, you know, I came to, uh, to art and I visited you in, uh, in Vienna. And I remember always that uh, first meeting happened in uh, a studio called Riva. It was a kind of a factory, an abandoned <laughs> factory. There also Alois Mosbach and some other artists yeah. work. Um, and you were at that time working on two series of works, which are very little known today. So I thought it would be interesting to kind of somehow talk about these works. It's the beginning somehow of your sculpture. And you work on sculptures made out of wood, many wooden elements kind of brought together. But you were also hammering on uh, metallic objects like pins. And other also bigger objects like um, uh, yeah, barrels. Yeah. So could you I tell mean, us about these beginnings? When I became interested in art, I wanted to become a painter. I was painting a lot when I was a scholar in, in school with friends. We shared ideas, and I was painting. And my dream was to be accepted on the art school um, academy and um, to study art. But they didn't accept me in, in, in the sculpture in the painting class. They put me in the sculpture class. And a big shock, but uh, I thought, okay, this is this could also be a challenge, and I tried to work on the notion of sculpture and hammering for several reasons what a big recognizable notion as a sculptor working as a sculptor. So the hammering became for a certain uh, a period of time very important as an attitude. Also, the collecting of things which um, only consists of two dimension, like boards or like vessels and to transfer them back into really three-dimensional thing or to create something three-dimensional things with them. So this was the very beginning. And you were but actually, before yeah. you came, there was a room and there's this young, weird guy traveling around and trying to see artists. So there was a really strong rumor before you came. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that one day he was calling and uh, the parents were waiting outside and this young boy, he was 17, tall, and I mean, still in puberty, I guess. Uh, very exciting. And he already knew all the artists. And he came in and said, I have a big collection at home. And I was at Baselitz. And I was at that time very famous Lippards and many others. And I have all the pieces at home, which was very special. And anyway, at that time, it was kind of a very exciting moment in the studio because you also uh, were then, in a way, experimenting on so many different things. There was already this kind of spirit of. Uh, 
uh, endless experimentation going on, and painting was still there because you paint these hammered objects. It was still you had not left. Painting, well, right? I used the I used the color to add another layer, a sculptural yeah. layer, because I've realized with color I can change form, which was not very complicated. And then I also at that time I don't know if you remember I made these balls with oil paint. I just took oil paint. Like if you would have uh, many oil paintings, they would scratch down the color and make a ball with it, like a snowball. So I made these little balls that were both sculptures and paint, paintings at the same time. And then something happened soon after, and particularly in a way in the very late 80s, which is a real process of change because you kind of reoriented yourself, clothes started to enter the work. You brought in these found clothes. Could you tell us about, because that's a very major change. Well, the change came uh, probably through a pragmatic reason, pra pragmatically reason, because the first studio I had was close to a factory. They made furniture and had a lot of waste wood, what I could use for free. And then I changed the studio, and then I came to close to a, a company. They made uh, cans and barrels, and they used all these materials. We were also, we were, was able to have many things, and then I changed again the studio, and then I came to Riba, and there was um, a, a company close that were dealing with old cloths, and there was this gigantic, um, gigantic amount of cloths, and I started to work with this. Before that, I worked with my own clothes, but, but you don't do this for a long time because then you run out of the materials. So I, I was there. This was very, very exciting because the cloths I realized then. It was about again about sculptural uh, sculptural notion. Uh, it's like this, the second layer of the second skin, and yeah, this became a very important part of life. And it's of course very connected to what we see the exhibition here, because already then you started to somehow work with instructions, the early instructions at the beginning of the nineties, yes. instructions of what one could do with these sweaters and uh, clothes. But the instructions came. I had this show. I, I made this. Folded sweaters on very specific forms. I, I selected ten forms, and uh, I was folding the sweaters with two nails on the walls in very specific forms, which were a reminder to some pieces of Duchamp and to others. And then uh, a gallery in San Francisco wanted to show these pieces. He had no money to bring me over, and I had not no money to fly there. So actually, uh, what I did, I, I made very precise instruction drawings and called, called him and told him. He, he should buy sweaters in a certain color, so a curatorial choice. And he bought sweaters, and then I sent him the instructions by fax at that time, just to show him how to hang it. And then he said, so and what, what shall I do when I sell these pieces? And he sold some pieces. And I told him, you probably do the same. You fold the sweaters, like if you would have bought a sweater in a shop, and then you give the, the, the collector an instruction drawing, and that they have to realize the piece at home. So this was the beginning of the short living uh, sculptures. So that was kind of, it was not yet one minute, but it was the beginning of that time. The short living, yeah, and of the instruction drawing also. And then you also, early on, had this idea, I remember, that one could wear all the clothes in the water. How did this epiphany happen? Uh, this was, a, a, again, uh, um, uh, part of the research on the sculptural notion. You know, there's mass, volume, uh, surface, uh, time, many different things. So and I thought, what's going on if uh, I try, for example, to double or to triple or to multiply the surface? And so I asked one of my best friends if he would be able to wear the whole water of the O's at the same time. And I was feeling this. And yes, he was putting different layers on top of it, but at the same time, he became very sculptural because he was growing. All of a sudden, he put more volume and he changed. And means uh, the, the thing was uh, when you when you change volume, you change content. And this was the interesting thing. And there's a very important work. I was about reading about this this morning, and you told me about it in our Venice interview called Psycho, and that was the first set of instructions that you made. Can you tell us about the genesis of that? Oh, which one? Psycho. Ah, it was the yes, it, it was the, related to the to the sweater pieces. Um, I was, I was dealing, as I said, with the issue of, of, of the notion of sculpture. And I realized when you put a, a sweater over your body and over your hand, not showing the face, you in a way uh, change and transform into an anthropomorph form. 
but not showing a specific personality, but only showing a being a human being or a kind of it, a human being. And uh, so I made this video and, and filmed different positions for uh, I don't know, 20 seconds. And then I added the next layer and the next layer. And I did this with, with friends of mine and myself. So we're putting things, pullover and trousers and, and shirts and different kind of clothes on our body. And then changed it uh, very radically. Um, and, but what was happening there was for me so interesting because when I looked at this, um, of course, many, many of these small, short living sculptures, 20 second living sculptures, uh, were ridiculous, were unserious, were in a way jokeful. And before a certain moment of, uh, in, in my career, in my life, I would not um, accept these things. And therefore, I, for the first time, I accepted these non-pleasant, stupid parts of the work. And this was the first work which got a big audience, which got accepted because all of a sudden psychology, philosophy, social issues became very, very, very important in the piece. And that was also the time when we started our duo uh, collaboration. Yes, yes. had started this project with uh, Dr. Lavi and Christian Volkansky, where we thought it would be uh, somehow urgent to do an exhibition which is only constituted by instructions and by how to manners, and we could send the instructions around the world, and then people could just do it. And that's actually, I mean, we worked on 160 shows together, because that show has happened 160 mm -hmm. times, you know, since 1993, and it's kind of also fascinating that it has never stopped. Uh, uh, there has always been a do it version somewhere in the world since 1993, because in a way um, it's self organized. And that's something uh, where your instructions play such a key role, because in a way people could you, use that instructions and people could just do it. Can you tell us a little yeah, bit yeah. about that? It was the beginning of this participation also, which is absolutely it's my, my first so called do it, with the first one minute sculpture. The first one minute sculpture. So actually, what I did, I made this little instruction, but like a like a platform, like this, and I made a drawing on it, like the piece outside, and I invited people to step on the platform and follow the instruction and realize the piece by following the instruction. I remember one piece where this was with a sweater, and the other one was with a wooden box where they had to go in and put their legs apart and then carry something, whatever. And then there's a follow-up kind of, which was very important because I, I saw. Uh, the pieces are very ephemeral, the one minute sculptures too ephemeral. And I thought in the art world, ephemeral pieces, they would fade out in, in the face of the people. So I, I had to try to keep them longer. For that reason, I, I used Polaroid. Uh, so people could make a snapshot and take the pieces with themselves. I would even sign them and uh, sign it for 100 euro, 100 dollar. I thought it's a great business idea. It was actually not at all, but still. Um, <laughs> And because it ended on eBay, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and this went on for a certain period of time, and uh, yeah, and then you know it faded out, and it was taken over by uh, social media photographs, by uh, all the things that we have today. And the drawings, there are different type of drawings. We're going to talk later on in the interview about the amazing new drawings you're doing, which are upstairs here. But uh, in terms of instructions, there are two kind of drawings. There are the ones which are instructions, you already mentioned, and then there are the others, um, uh, basically, which are the drawings that the audience can't execute. Can you tell us a little bit about these different... Yeah, the, as I said already, the instruction drawings, they had really a, a very strong pragmatic reason it was possible to send pieces abroad. It was actually a little bit like uh, a theater instruction, uh, like a party tour, so uh, the pieces could be realized without me being present. So I could ask somebody to, uh, actually what we did also, we sent the drawing by FedEx, and uh, the gallery at the museum had to pause the, the, the drawing on the, on, the, on the platform, so it was still a drawing of mine, with my hand writing also, and uh, it was fantastic because I, it wasn't necessary to travel and it wasn't necessary to, you know, have all this transport and shipping going on. I asked the curator to organize the, the pieces, the tools, the, the, the whatever we call it, the daily life objects. And I sent the other, I sent the drawing, so the pieces were very, very easy. At least I loved it at the time. And then, of course, there is this moment when it all led to the one minute culture idea. I always think it's interesting, you know, when I speak to scientists, you know, I, many years ago I met uh, Albert Hoffman. The, the Swiss scientist who discovered LSD, and 
he remembered exactly the day when he made this discovery, you know, the famous bicycle story. And then a few years later, I met Benoit Mandelbrot, and he, you know, he's called a fractal classroom. And there was a blackboard, it wasn't really very clean, and suddenly, you know, he somehow saw fractals. So I'm always interested how ideas are, are born. So I wanted to ask you if you remember the day when the one minute sculpture, which is so central in the show here, was invented and you had these epiphany. No. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, no. But I remember I was I went through a long period of, uh, of uh, really bad things what were happening to me with family, so it was really dramatic. And it didn't work for one and a half years. Uh, I always, I always hated the idea that, that the artist has to suffer to do something great in, in, in his life. I hated it because it's a romantic idea from the 19th century. I thought. So things in a way happened to me, uh, similar things. So, um, and then after one and, one and a half years, I, I was invited to make a show in a small Kunstverein in Germany, in, in, in Bremen. And um, I had this idea since a long time in my head, but I never was able to realize and fulfill it. So I called the guy, the director, and said, yeah, I'm willing to do the, the show, but I do not want to send anything. I do not want to send pieces I have already done. I would like to go there, let's say, 10 days in advance and uh, uh, make the pieces there. And they were all very frightened and, and not very happy. <laughs> Because of course they were nervous. Uh, what's going to happen in a week or in ten days? And I went there and tried everything out. I asked, uh, I asked if he would allow me to work with the people there, a lot of the people who were employees there, and and the tools were, which were laying around. And uh, first I tried everything out with myself, and then I asked him and all the others to do this, and we made the one minute sculpture. So that in that moment it was called one minute sculpture. I was looking for a synonym for very short, you know, it's just a synonym for it can be 10 seconds or good minutes, it doesn't count. So it was there for the first time in 1997 when I called them on minute sculptures, but the short living sculptures I've done before. So it all started in Bremen, and you also, just before that, which is sort of interesting, you spent six months in this very difficult time of your life writing a channel, right? It was a, in the, in the yeah. lead way of it, you wrote this, this channel. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> but do you write? Mm, no, I don't. It's not well. That was Robert is sitting here. I wrote a, I wrote a word sculpture. It became a theater piece then, but I wouldn't do it again. It was once for a time. And, uh, I'm not doing this again. And talking more about the, you know, the, the one minute idea. So of course it had to do with this idea of of, of turning an action into a sculpture. And I was sort of thinking when. But this is, this is, this is, this is, I tried it. I made many researches, for example, for me it was very important to understand when I stand straight or when you stand straight and still, is this a, it's an action, of course, but can it also be a sculpture? Can it turn, the, can it turn into a sculpture? What has to happen? Do I have to squeeze a movement, for example? Do I have to squeeze it into slow motion? How, how long do I have to squeeze the, the movement, the slow motion movement that it stops in our brain? Of course, it doesn't really stop. So those were, those were very important questions at that time. And I was making many research about this. And who were the artists who kind of inspired you? Because I was thinking, um, actually, when I came here uh, and entered the space, I, you know, I had this stretch that memory thing about Gilbert and Charles uh, being here at the opening of this space. And they, of course, you know, had this epiphany of the, of the living sculpture where Gilbert and Charles got no, no, I, I loved one, uh, uh, Gilbert and Charles a lot for many years. And I estimate they were drawn, especially the early work, the underneath the arches and all these things. They're really great, great pieces. Uh, but also, also Joseph Boyce was very influential for me, uh, especially at that time, I think, when they were in the Met with the But also many others. At the very beginning, I came to art through the three of surrealists. And, uh, but this, mm, there are, you know, these faded art in a way. But uh, yeah, in many. But uh, yeah. So in the time when we met in Berlin, there was there was part, because we actually had this other great encounter in '88. Uh, you had the DAV, uh, the grant in Berlin, this fantastic idea in Berlin that artists get studios for six months. And I remember we went together to uh, East Berlin and yeah. bought a lot of literature about yeah. I don't remember that, but I, I remember that we were there together. Yes. And at that time, you also talked about Franz Erhard Walter as a kind yeah. of an inspiration. And that's of course also interesting because he did his work kind of yes, fantastic work. Yeah. Fantastic work. I was a bit surprised then in the 80s when everybody got you know shocked with this 
all of a sudden new painting and the, the many many ideas of before of the 70s faded out because of this big impact of the 80s. Uh, that's a very that's a very a fragile situation of the arts when you do something for your whole life. And I remember Franz Eberhard I spoke with him once and he told me this, but he was quite known and he was quite successful. All of a sudden, painting came and faded so many things out, made so many things disappear for strange reasons. Uh, this happened again to the, to the new uh, painting. So this was this is happening again and again, over and again. And, uh, there was a certain moment of Franz Eberhard Walker's work we are having in a way made an attribute to color, and all of a sudden these pieces became very colorful. Very, very certainly, we found that they moved back. Thanks, Carl. And can you tell us about the one minute sculpture here? Because there are so many that when we, when we did the last interview, you counted um, up to 90, I think, and now it's 100. No, 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 no. no, no. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we made the interview two years ago. The, I made the first one minute sculpture in 1997. I called them yeah. the first time in 1997. And until now, I made, I think, 100, I don't know exactly, but it's in the book, I never counted it really, but I think it's 110, 150 or whatever. I mixed it up because at that time we did, the, we did, the, we wrote them all together. And I thought it's 99, it was more, um, but it means in 20 years I made 120 pieces, let's say 120 pieces. It means I took very, very much care that it wouldn't spread out and I wouldn't overdo it because the pieces are very close to the, um, uh, Hard to get anyway. So I thought I have to be very, very strict with these pieces. And I only showed them in, for many years, I only showed them in museum context. I was invited so often to parties and to shows and to exhibitions and to openings. Can't please and make a one of these captures? I always said no, because that would have killed the pieces. So I wanted to make it very strict. And yes, I could have made thousands, maybe ten thousands, but that's not the point. I wanted to make only a few very concentrated and very in a very rigid form and be, be in a way brutal also with the piece and with the perception of the piece. So for that reason, maybe they are still asking the I show them. And then of course there are the bombs here. And I thought because we all experienced and it great to hear a little bit the thinking behind the one minute sculpture here, which is part of the patriot, and where people actually you no longer um, ask people to actually get the photograph on that order people can take the photograph. Can you talk? Yeah, here we, we make an exception because uh, for many years I didn't do this anymore with the with the Polaroids because mostly people do it with a mobile phone and, and put it on Instagram or somewhere else. And there were for a certain period of time there were many um, uh, uh, pages or whatever uh, pages on the internet with one minute sketches. Actually, not my one minute sketches. People created parallel one minute sketches. Which was very exciting also because all of a sudden I realized something was going on and the pieces were used so often in advertisements, not asking me and by, by fashion photographers and by advertisement photographers and in, in really spreading out all over the world. And, and I saw many advertisements um, not asking me and uh, in a way insulting my work in and in a way disrespecting authorship and things like that. So it's a big problem. It's interesting, it's good, it's an honor also, but it's also a big problem. But what was the question? So. <laughs> <laughs> but just tell us a little bit more about the one here. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah, this one here. Now this one was, this one actually it's a nice one because um, um, when you put the, it's two buckets, yeah, you have to put it with, you have to stand in one bucket. It's complicated because the feet are mostly bigger than the ground of the bucket. And then you have to put the other bucket on the head and then all of a sudden this takes all your, all the space organization out of you and you're close to fall down and fade because uh, you, you cannot keep a equilibrium. Uh, how do you call it? Yeah. It's equilibrium. Uh, it's, yeah. And then people like, like to get a photo from this, but it's so tricky because everybody looks more or less the same. <laughs> but everybody wants it. So <laughs> and then, of course, you know, I want, was wondering about the um, rumor. There is a rumor because you know, talked about rumors before. There is a rumor. About an unrealized one minute sculpture you wanted to do for London, which. Oh, yes. And, and I'm always interested in unrealized photos because, you know, we know a lot about architects' unrealized photos because they publish them relentlessly and uh, usually get reality built through publishing unrealized projects. And there are so many, you know, unrealized projects of artists we don't know about. 
projects which are too big to be realized, too small to be realized. Silvio Marelles once told me, you know, there is this little cube. He always wanted to do a little tiny little cube in the museum, and the whole rest of the museum should be empty. They took him 20 years to find a museum from do that. So that project was too small to be realized. And then, of course, there are the utopic projects like Sia Amanjani probably already wanted to create a sculpture in the 60s, actually, from the Earth to the Moon. And that was a bit big to be realized. Then there are projects which are science of indeed, or also for public art, projects which were, you know, lost competition entries. And last but not least, there's another category of unrealized projects, which Doris Lessing actually, when Julia and I did the first Serpentine Marathon in 2006, uh, we invited Ren Colas to do it uh, with us, and, you know, we had um, more than 50 Londoners, over 24 hours, you know, basically being interviewed by Ren and me at the corner of the city. We never left the stage, so it was an exercise in in sleeplessness uh, for 24 hours. And after 24 hours, we faced the amazing Doris Lessing, which was a very difficult interview to do in our exhausted state. But she was amazing, and she told us about this idea, which I've never, you know, I've always thought about since then, which is that there is not only the unrealized project we couldn't do because of outside, you know, obstacles, but there are also the ones we, we, we couldn't do because we, had, we did not dare to do them. So there are many reasons why one wouldn't realize a project. If you have a very exciting one minute culture for London, which I, I yes. think everybody would love to hear about. And they asked me for the for this Trafalgar Square pedestal uh, to make it to, to propose a piece. And uh, I proposed a piece and I didn't hear from them. Then, <laughs> but then they wrote back and they said, could you come and pass by? And it, I think it was the head of the I don't know what they were inviting me. Anyway, I was there and explained the piece. And the piece was, you know, the, the one these structures are based, we are dealing very often with stupidity also, ridiculousness, um, embarrassment, issues which are very touchy, very close to all of us. So I thought it would be, at, the, at that time, I thought it would be great. Now I know it was really stupid, but anyway, I was so stubborn that I didn't come with another idea. So basically the idea died, so I didn't do a piece there. But the piece was, I wanted to ask the guy, stand straight, on the color and put uh, a dressed guy a banana in his ass. And uh, they didn't like it, obviously. <laughs> and I was stubborn and I said, I'm not offering something else. So the piece uh, wasn't realized. But it's of course also exciting because it was on a plane. And uh, but looking again uh, at the, uh, you know, the little film, which is about the Stadel exhibition, it was a very big show you did with Max Hollein at the, at the Stadel Museum. And there's a lot of talk about the importance of the plate. There is always a plate yes. with the one minute sculpture. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, because you know, when, when, when you do the pieces on, on, on the normal floor, uh, you're in, in the same way as the, as the public. Because what I found interesting when you, normally when you walk through an exhibition, you're a spectator, or you watch, you see a show, you're uh, a subject watching things, and then you transfer, you move, uh, transfer into an object being watched. It's, it's a very big step all of a sudden. But it, it's much more easy and much more interesting when, when the people who realize the pieces have to step on a pedestal on a platform because all of a sudden they're higher and the status is more defined. And, and in a way, it, you know, like, uh, as we know from Roman times and Greek times, all the big, all the big sculptures stand on platforms because it lifts them up so that the public could, could look at them more intensively, and, and this I found almost very exciting, and since then I do it, yeah. So there's this one minute sculpture for London, which is unrealized. Do you have other unrealized projects? Projects which are too big, or sensible, or forgotten, or too small, or too expensive, or projects that didn't have to do? Yes, I also wanted to make a solo show with only one, one minute sculpture. I did work that also. Um, and, well, I mean, I, I, make, I make many pieces, um, where I failed dramatically. The first fat house, um, because what the idea was, um, again, from the sculptural point of view, when we gain or lose weight, uh, we work with volumes. And means uh, when we gain or lose weight, one can say it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a work on sculpture because it's dealing with, with volumes and it's changing content. So I thought it would be interesting to transfer a technical system like a car or a technological system like a, a house uh, into a, or, or combine it together with a, with a biological system which is growing there. And the first house I thought would be the first uh, when I thought I would like to make a house or use a house because I love modernistic architecture. I was uh, 
interested to make a piece with the house Mola from Karlsberg, uh, from the other by Albert Schloss. It's a beautiful house. Uh, that it, uh, Israeli ambassador, the ambassador is in there now. It's a beautiful modernistic house and it's famous because it has two windows, a balcony and the door, so it has a face. A very clear modernistic pure house. And I thought it, it would be great to make it fat. Because what, what I've realized through this obesity and, and through the growing, all of a sudden the pieces become a human. So the car got a face, the house got a face. So I did this and we made it in real, I mean, 10 meter high, and it's, uh, I don't know, 8 meter wide, not really real, but nearly real, so 10 meter high, 8 meter wide, and so on. And we made it that it was enormous, um, difficult, and, and expensive, and everything. But it turned out it looked like one of these uh, inflatable castles for children when they jump around. So it looked like this, yeah. so I had to totally kick it out and destroy it. And then I came back to the traditional saddle roof house and it worked there much, much easier, much, more, much better. Now you mentioned the face you know, of, the, of the house and one that brings to my mind something actually which I saw in 88 when we met in, when we saw each in Berlin at the time. It's another kind of unknown series of yours that you kind of overpainted photographs from oh, yeah. magazines and you, you started to remove the face and that came to my mind also because, in a way, that's ongoing with many of the sculptures. This whole yeah. new series of sculpture, which uh, basically welcomes the viewer in the very first space, and you enter the gallery here. They do not have spaces, they have stones, all kinds of other things. Can you talk a little bit about how the faces disappear and maybe about this new sculpture? Yes, I mean, there are very only a few faces, uh, self created faces in my work. Um, I always found. Uh, I didn't find a, a, a form which I could accept. The face is so complicated. And I see so many bad faces in the other world. Uh, really horrible. And I didn't want to have another one. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't want to offend anybody. But I really, it's really terrible. And so I decided to make figures without hands because to, to get rid of this problem, which was an, an, an intense problem for me. And also because in the meantime I made, as we spoke about, these pieces with sweaters and clothes over the head, but the, the head was not there anyway. So I could kick out personality, which allowed me to speak in a more abstract way about, about, about psychology and about, and about uh, uh, I used the German words. Uh, uh, so. And the rocks? Because then suddenly there are rocks. Yeah, suddenly the rocks, the rocks. You know, Austria and, and, and Germany um, have this heavy history. And um, I always found the rock is such a brutal, natural instrument. When we deal with this, it's heavy and it's uh, abstract and it's uh, non specific. And it would be nice that the rocks have legs and what would someone get out of these if rocks would have legs. So, but then I make these small rocks and it's in a way um, uh, it makes them ridiculous. Uh, so I can't explain it more. <laughs> no, but I think we can talk about more. Which is, what is interesting is that something you said before about these small sculptures, like the one with the yes. rock, is the fact that you know you, you all of a sudden felt that working with a lot of you know uh, factories and production facilities and the systems, and you also kind of wanted to be to be alone or to make work alone. But, but this relates to the pieces of yeah. to the yeah. ceramics, yes. Because when I mean, like many artists in the last, let's say, 10, 20 years, uh, I, I I stepped into the same trap. I uh, had assistants, many assistants, and they realized my pieces, and I was. I turned into someone who was making sketches, sketches and, the, and the assistants realized the pieces like a fat car. I'm not doing much when I do the fat car. We define the form, but even now I, I'm not defining this, the form myself. An assistant defines the form, and then I come and check if it's, if it's good or not. And if it's not good, I make drawings that it should make it better. But I'm not putting a hand in the car. But on these ceramics, I put hand in it. And it was so great because. Not only I made uh, the form myself, I mean, from the very beginning out to the very end, everything was done by myself. And I loved it. It brought me back in the very, in the very certain strong connection, physical connection to doing art. And 
this changed the perception, this changed the way of, of doing and way of thinking very strongly. And the same with the drawings, for the reason I love drawing also. And the same in a way also with the Polaroids. It brought me back in a way to this very intense, interesting so I cannot describe the soul in English. No, so it pull, but it's before it and it pulls you into something, no? Yeah. I can only describe it, I don't know the word in English. <laughs> it pulls you in. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and the drawings, so that's another thing we haven't talked about. There's a whole big wall of drawings upstairs, and um, actually these drawings were first shown in a museum show, I think. You, I saw the book, it was in Luzern, and also at the Albertina. Albertina is, of course, the amazing drawing collection, one of the great drawing collections in the world. So, and that's, I mean, you've always made drawings. You make these overpainted drawings, I know, from the 80s, where you erase the faces, you make the, the sketches for sculptures, you make the instructions for uh, the, the do-it-yourself pieces, the yeah. one minute sculptures. But here's yeah. something else, up. it's a different yeah. kind of drawing. Can you tell us about this, this new series? Yes, there are different parts. So the first is the instruction drawing, which was important in my work because I could do something um, uh, without being present or without being there. And then the other one is little sketches for realized sculptures. I make uh, sketchbooks when I have an idea for the sculpture, I memorize it and make little drawings. And I keep them and then I look after time, after a certain time, I look at it again. And when things pop up, then I, I draw them again in another book. So it's, it's, a, like, it's, a, it's a system of finding uh, uh, the right way to realize the pieces. And then I, have, I show drawings a little bit sometimes here and sometimes there and when I make bigger shows. And once the critic wrote, I make bad drawings. And I said, okay, um, so I have to prove myself if I'm a better drawer. And I started to make drawings with myself, uh, looking at myself in the mirror, as many artists did, uh, all, uh, all over the, the time and the years. And I've realized when I start walking, uh, when, when it's, a, it's, a, it's a psychological project to draw, and it, it has a lot to do with, with different aspects. So when I make, for example, when I, when I draw you, when I, um, I'm not interested in, uh, in the portrait that somebody can read or, or recognize you. It's like when you walk in a face, like you walk through a landscape and you follow the lines and you follow, let's say, the hills and the rivers. And all of a sudden it became a sculptural process because we are exist of many ups and downs and, and, and forms. And, plastic forms, and this was so exciting, and then when I go on with this, and I also, uh, uh, it, it, it produces a very certain attitude that you look on, up to our world from a very a different angle, and it's, uh, it's just pure joy. And also there's a lot of self portraits in that series. And yeah, because, you, you know, when you, I mean, I have myself all the time, <laughs> and so it's easier to work with myself. Yeah, you say that you're an easy victim. Yeah. <laughs> in the past, yeah. yeah. Now, we can open it up, I think, for, for questions. I have one last question. I have many, many more questions. But in between, we should take a few questions from all of you. And I have one last question before we open it up, which is uh, Rainer Maria Rilke wrote this you know, lovely little book, one of my favorite books, which is the advice to a young poet. And I see lots of young artists here in the audience. So I was wondering what, in 2019, would be your advice to, to a young Artists, well, go on, be stubborn. Don't listen to others. Learn from others. I mean, thank you so so much. You're very welcome. So, do we have questions for Erwin Rom? Got a question here in the back. If you can have the microphone, please. In the very, oh, there's also a question here. Either way. Hi, it's just a very simple question. Can you drive the car? Can you, can can I you drive the car? No. Why not? Well, it's so complicated. It could be done easily, but you would never get the, the, the allowance from the authorities to drive this strange vehicle, which right now is just forget it. It's too complicated. Because there are very strict rules and laws in Europe how a car has to look. 
and that you see the lights from all the different angles. You just forget about it. Once I got asked by an American if I would uh, uh, plan a car with him that he could produce, and then he realized himself it's just too complicated. It would be nice because you can make it with rubber and then it could bump around. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking also we thought it would be amazing as a self driver car. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have other questions? Julia? Um, I'm very fascinated by your furniture research. And you're relatively late edition of the show, but I think you're really interested in that. So far as there is a kind of meat on set with drawings and then furniture pieces. Could you talk a little bit about how the design architecture is in your work? And whether it's an ongoing theme or whether it's something you can age no, it's an ongoing, ongoing theme. I was, I was very, I'm very much interested in design, good design, and, and, and also car design, and also architectural design, architecture, very, very much, because it's such an important impression, expression of our, of our every time, and the same as art. And um, I was working with this since a, long, since a long time. So basically, when I used furniture. I make different series. In one series, which, I, which is going to be shown next week, in, actually this week, in, in, in Berlin on Friday, I have an opening at the Johann Koenig Gallery, and I transfer I transferred furniture, which I reuse in a very different context, in a different way, and make uh, uh, very specific so-called drinking sculptures out of it. And then I, you know, a furniture and a car is something stiff and something made of wood, which you cannot change or which cannot be soft. So, and then we did, them, uh, we did those furniture in clay, and then I tried to sit on them or to walk in on them or to dance on these furniture, and all of a sudden it became soft and, and I, could, I was walking on the bed. And the interesting thing was, it was so poetic because um, I had I think was having shoe and I had traps, you know, but not shoe on, shoe and traces. I had traces on the bed, all of a sudden, there traces like if I would have walked in there. No, but I was walking on a mattress. So, this combination of uh, this poetic combination, I like very much. But then, after, when, when the clay is dry, we cast the clay and we, we make it in bronze or in, in, another, in another material. But the question of design, Julia asks, also leads us to the question. Of architecture, and you know, we talk about the houses. I was wondering if you ever thought of going into architecture, of actually building a house one could live in. Actually, I also get asked by someone if we could make fat housing to turn into a living house. Would be possible? No, but but for me, it's a tool to to to, to address social issues and, and to address uh, sculptural issues. Uh, when I made my parents' house, um, when I squeezed my parents' house. My parents have this, uh, uh, it's a bungalow, uh, let's say it's 20 meters long and I don't know, 9 meters high and 10 meters wide. And I rebuilt it, but I squeezed it into one meter. So it's 20 meters long, 9 meters high, but just one meter wide. And people could go in and all the, all the apartments, so all the rooms were squeezed, all the furniture was squeezed, all the wallpaper was squeezed. So when you came in immediately, you got this flash. Of, Claustrophobia and, and restricted the area. And, uh, um, yeah. Do we have more questions? The question, many questions, amazing. One in the second row, one in the third row. What social issues do you address? Sorry? What social issues? You said you want to address social Sociality. issues. Ah, you okay. mentioned claustrophobia. <laughs> Yes, yes, but well, let, 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 let me explain with this example, because my parents built the house in the 60s. Uh, I grew up in the 50s, and Austria was at that time uh, still a post-war country with uh, post-war society, a very rigid society, and I grew up being beaten in school. And, uh, but I found it normal at that time, I did find something strange in it. Uh, so with this house from the 60s, when you go in, you have immediately this flashback to this time. You see this uh, strange uh, uh, surrounding was a very Catholic. So when you see the bedroom of my parents, for example, the bedroom was six meters long and four meters wide, but I squeezed it as I squeezed the whole, the whole house. So the, the, the bedroom was still six meters long, but 40 centimeters wide. 
of 50 centimeters wide, uh, 40 centimeters wide, and there was the double bed, and on the top of the double bed was the cross, and the cross was also squeezed. So the vertical, the vertical uh, uh, piece of wood uh, was long, uh, but very thin, and, but the horizontal was very wide and very short. So all of a sudden, it transfers certain ideas into something else. Where I found very exactly. And I use quite often the word paradox. For example, the fat car. Uh, it, it's a typical case of paradox. A paradox thing. Uh, a technical system of a car becomes fat, is growing, gets obese, and, and it's changing and, and combining different things, which are not very exciting. The paradox is interesting because I, I found this quote where you said, it's an interview, a recent interview with Joe Lai. And you talk about your fear for the planet, so it goes from the, your question of the social issues you know, to environmental issues, your fear for the plan planet, to quote you here, I'm horrified right now about our environment, about our future and the future in general. Many people think my work is funny, but I think my tool is the idea of the absurd, like with Eugene Ionesco and Samuel Beckett and also Paradox. Yes, very much. I mean, uh, of course, I'm very, I'm very concerned about our planet. It's not so, it's not so complicated to be, to be very concerned about our planet. The most the frightening thing is that most people don't care, and only a few care. And the most people don't. Many people think it doesn't exist, and it's just uh, uh, whatever a bad imagination. But uh, I'm very scared for these things, very much. And what because I have children, and I, I see the young people. And, I mean, when, when, when I remember growing up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, we had this beautiful, bright vision of the future. We could discover the world, that we could do anything. Now, when I look at the young people, excuse me, I mean, what can they be fond of? What can they, what can they, can they be uh, happy? Or can they expect the future with great, with open arms? I doubt. And what's the role, because you mentioned paradox, the role of the absurd and the paradox, as you mentioned often Ionesco and, and, and Beckett, it's interesting because before we met, about a year before we met when I was 60, I met Eugene Ionesco in the streets of San Carlos and then we went for coffee. Uh, and you know, the old playwright uh, Ionesco came to Switzerland because he was sort of fed up with writing plays and he wrote uh, and he made um, in this famous Swiss gallery, Erko, uh, where also uh, Tapies worked and uh, also Asper Young. Many artists in the 50s and 60s, the late UNESCO came there to make lithographs. So he made very childlike really drawings, really almost like children drawings. They're very beautiful. At the end of his life, he didn't know. And it was amazing because it somehow connects his idea of time, living sculpture, because he basically said that a time sculpture can be as, I mean, he didn't call it a time sculpture, but sort of time can be as eternal as bronze. Because we went for coffee, and it had a huge impact on me because he basically said, you know, my play, La Conta de Show, the bold singer, uh, plays every night in a the theater since the 50s. It still plays every night, which is astonishing. There's not been a single evening where this play was not fun. And so he said with a laughter, you know, my play is more permanent than many brass cultures of one of my friends, of some of my friends, which I installed, and then this installed. Well, it's kind of interesting. That's yeah, true, exactly. Very true. I mean, remember, Michelangelo said uh, his cultures uh, should still exist 500 years after they were rolling down a mountain. That's a, that's a very different connotation. And yes, the same idea I had, uh, I had with the Vanilla sketches. I had to find a lot to find something uh, uh, suitable to our time, short living time where we destroy things, nobody, where, uh, nobody repairs things anymore. So I wanted to find an equivalent to this. And, yeah, that's a try. We have more questions here, many more questions. There's a question here in the very back. Can have the microphone in the very back? Um, Birgit Jürgensen had an um, obsessive and interesting relationship with Polaroids, and she was your contemporary. Um, yes, Birgit Jürgensen? Yeah, 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 I know her. Yeah. And I was wondering how this sits, you know, how Oeuvre sits in terms of your Oeuvre, given that we're surrounded by Polaroids. I actually know Birgit Jürgensen quite well because she had a studio above our studio. I had the first studio with a, a group of artists together, and she was above with her boyfriend or husband at that time. But you know, um, she didn't play much uh, a role in, in, in my work at that time because at that time 
She was focused as someone who tried Viennese actionism from a, from a, a female point of view. So at that time, unfair enough, nobody took her serious. Me included. But then I, I discovered her work afterwards, and I must say it's a great girl of work. And it's, it's, uh, it deserves to be better, to get better and, and, and wider recognition. Yes, I have a question. Yes. What is offense uh, in your practice and how far it can go? But obviously, uh, disturbing art can bring us to uh, existential uh, crisis and then rebirth. Where is this fine line in your practice? When I ask people to uh, be models for, my, for the one minute sketches in the first years, now it's different. Uh, I try to expand boundaries, but never wild or never aggressive in a way like I never show naked people, I never show I never show vulgar things. So I try to do it at a very specific level. Uh, and uh, people accept it to be led, to be to, to step over uh, over a certain border. But they did everything for, with free will. Because as a photographer or as an artist, when you invite people to do something and they are not they don't accept what you ask them and you still make a picture, they can sue you like crazy. So I had always this, this, this idea to do things in a certain in a certain concept. As I said, this, the absurd was very interesting for me because when we think from or when we look onto our world from a from a, another perspective, let's say the absurd or uh, the paradox, then all of a sudden you see more or you see different things. And this was so exciting. Sometimes you see nothing. That's also true. But sometimes you see much more interesting things. But you never can know before. You have to try and try a lot. And that's what many things are made. I did ask more about audience than models, actually. Yeah, the audience, you know. Um, I'm a dictator with the audience when it comes to my one minute structure. They have to follow my instructions if they want to be a part of the piece and want to realize the piece. If they do it in my way, great, then they're peace of mind. If not, it's also okay. But then there's something else that they are, then they are not a structure by myself. Thank you. And coming back to your uh, quest, uh, to your uh, ecological concerns, don't you think that generations from 60s were not aware, not active? And generation born in the 80s aware and not active, and millennials actually aware and active. Oh, many were aware and were active, but nobody took it serious because the problem was small at that time. I remember yeah. also people demonstrating yeah. against a big, what, a big a a power station, a power, power, power station, and the dam. It was a big scandal. And actually, the Green Party was founded after that, but it was a smaller problem, a relatively smaller problem. Marginal in a way, but nowadays it's huge. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We can take one or two more questions. We've, yeah, we've got another question here in the back. And we've got a side and the right. So, if a child was in the room, let's say 10 year old, um, I was looking at the, the polarities around, how would you explain, sort of communicate what is it that you do, like in the, in the simplest terms? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. It was acoustically different. I could hear the beginning. If a child was in the room, and so, then so let's say there's a ten-year-old in your room, um, and he would like to understand what is it yeah, that you do. How would you explain to him, communicate what, you, what your work is about? Well, I have realized, and it sometimes annoys me, annoys me, that parents come to me and say, "Oh, we have seen your show. My kids love it so much." <laughs> <laughs> It's not always the best <laughs> to hear this. <laughs> one more question. So maybe then I have one last question, which is, you know, this idea of reaching beyond the art world, you know, and reaching into the wider world. It's a certain moment you know, when we met uh, your work already in the, in the, in the 80s or the 90s was very known in the art world, but then something happened. And it happened with the one minute sculptures, really, that all of a sudden the one minute sculptures, you know, went beyond the world of art. And one moment that that became apparent was when the rock, the hot, uh, the red hot chili peppers actually did this video in 2002. It was called Can't Stop. It's one of the rare moments actually where MTV credited an artist because very often they just took from artists. Can you tell us about that? I mean, it's two questions in one. Yeah. It's curious to hear about that. 
Red Hot Chili Pepper saga, but also more general when you felt and how you feel about this idea of the work going beyond the boundaries yeah. of the special offer. Well, first I have to say <coughs> I live in a quiet world. I, I work in a quiet world and I got um uh, second machine again. Confirmed. <laughs> I got, sorry? Confirmed. I got confirmed recently because I read an article that music is when you work very bad for the work. <laughs> <laughs> and when you learn and you listen to music, it's very bad for you, actually, so whatever. Uh, so I you never listen to music anywhere? Never, well, never, never. It's quiet. I like it quiet. Because my grandma always said, said you have to ask artists what music they listen to when they work. So you have to ask them. Look at his work and you understand. <laughs> 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 no. uh, so I got this call from Mark Romalek. I didn't know who this gentleman was. He, he, was, this, he was this very successful MTV uh, uh, producer. And to make uh, music videos with Prince and Michael Jackson and Rolling Stones and Madonna, everybody. And he, they called and said we, we, we would be interested. Uh, he makes his streaming video with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. If I would allow them to use the one minute sculptures. And I never heard the name Red Hot Chili Peppers. So I repeated it to my, to my assistant and they said Red Hot Chili Peppers and they were. Like this. And I understood, okay, this is maybe important, so that's okay. And, and then we made this, and I must say that everybody was extremely professional and like a great contract and I got paid. But I wanted, which was the most important thing, I wanted to be credited on MTV because I have seen myself personally many MTV videos uh, where all the ideas were stolen by artists. I could even name the artists and nobody got credited. It was normal at that time that they just got ripped off and nobody took care. And I was the first who got credited, which was amazing. But then what I wanted to add to the other question was um, uh, when I realized that some, as an artist, we work, we make shows together in the museums, but I always find the public space very important. Art because in the past public space was most important in Italy and in Greece and everywhere. Art outside, outside of the gallery, art outside of the museum, in the streets or in the cities, in the places. But I, uh, then I realized that the public space at that time in the 80s and 90s was the media, the mass media. So I started to make this culture for the mass media. So I got many invitations and I was asked by many magazines, I don't know, the walk and, and interview and people to create um, uh, uh, performative sculptures, one minute sculptures uh, for them in these magazines. And this I did many, many times. So for that reason, the, the pieces were really, 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 really right. And, but at the same time, I got copied so often. And I said, when I copied you, I do it myself. So it was this kind of, yes, backlash. That could not be a more wonderful conclusion. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you all. Thank you.